about five years ago, I had a, a dinner with a, an old friend. And I was sharing with him the difficulties I was going through and how I, uh, I was complaining. And he looked at me and he said, Dave, do you want to be right or you want to be happy? You can't have it both ways. And it went right through my heart. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, Proverbs 27, 6 says. In June 2000, there was an issue of London's Daily Express and it carried an article with a big headline, Can You Learn to Forgive? And it started with this line, bearing a grudge can hold you back and even damage your health. The writer, Susan Pape, she had interviewed Dr. Ken Hart. He was a lecturer at Leeds University. And he'd been running the world's first forgiveness course. And it was a seminar designed to help people forgive their enemies and let go of grudges. It was a seminar designed uh, not necessarily for Christians, for people. People who participated were from all walks of life and situations, uh, from jilted husbands and, and wives, uh, victims of violence and bullying, and you can continue on the, the course there. And the one thing they had in common, they were all angry, bitter, and they wanted revenge. Apparently, as I said before, it wasn't necessarily a Christian course, and it's a, a perfect example of someone or a people doing something biblical without really knowing about it. And it clearly says to us that the world recognizes the benefits of a lifestyle of forgiveness. Unfortunately, a lot of us are lagging behind. And this took place more than 20 years ago. Some of us, we've been holding on to grudges a lot longer than that. Today I'm starting a series uh, based on a book by R.T. Kendall and the Bible <laughs> called Total Forgiveness. Uh, in the course of my lifetime, this is one of the most powerful books, if not the most powerful book I've read. And I think because of the subject matter. Um, a lot of us, we are pushed to the limits, or, or so we think as to how much we can forgive. And with many of us, because of the wrong we believe that was done to us, a lot of different areas in our life have been affected. Family, work, ministry, maybe even our sense of self-worth. And we feel like Job, in Job 3.26, when he said, I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Or David in Psalm 143, 7, he said, Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I'll be like those who go down to the pit. Forgiveness is not an easy thing. And honestly, it's not very easy for me to talk to you about. Um, because like you, I'm dealing with it daily. And sometimes I think... <laughs> I'm a pastor for 34 years. I should have this down. I should get this. But we pastors, we don't have it down any more than you do. And that's just being bluntly honest. Forgiveness is not an easy thing. Sometimes it's embarrassing when somebody confronts me and they say, you're a pastor. You should be the better man. You should be the bigger man. But I'm not. I'm just like you. I'm struggling through the process of forgiveness and under, trying to understand how to go about doing it. Jesus, he said, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. He also said in John 13, 35, that we should love one another. And we're told in, in Peter, in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of wrongs. 
I know those words, and so do many of you. But here's the thing. If we know those words, if we believe those words, why do we still hold back forgiveness? Why? Maybe because we rationalize our own attitudes and behaviors. That people need to be held accountable. Hey, somebody's got to tell them the truth. And we say that to, our, to ourselves, and, and yet our Heavenly Father, our Savior, Jesus Christ, spoke these words to us. Love each other deeply. Because when we do, it covers a multitude of sins. Jesus spoke these words to us because we can do it. And he told us to forgive. He told us to love because we can. And yet we continue to say we can't. Houston, we got a problem. Why would a loving father tell us to do something we can't do? I mean, that's just cruel. But he's not, and we know that. And we can do all things through him who gives us strength, correct? Isn't that what the word says? Do we really believe that? <laughs> Especially when it comes to forgiving and loving someone whom we've decided doesn't deserve it. R.T. Kendall, whose book I said is a basis for this total forgiveness, had an interaction with a man by the name of Joseph Tyson from Romania. And he said he had a situation in his life and there was a tremendous turmoil. It was a lot of hurt and he couldn't tell anybody because of the, the, the closeness of this situation. But he said, Joseph was so far removed. So RT shared it with him. And after he shared it with him, Yosef said, is that all? And RT said, yeah. And Yosef said, okay, you must totally forgive them. I, I can't, R.T. said. You can and you must, Yosef said back. And R.T. said that at that point, I, I tried to backtrack and tell him a little bit more about the situation. But not satisfied with the response, Yosef looked at me again and he said, you must totally Forgive them, release them, and you will be set free. Far easier said than done, right? Especially if the hurt is deep and it's still oozing. But even if it's not, it is a hindrance to the Holy Spirit working in and through us. R.T. said he was angry at first because he felt like this this would be a guy that he would put his arm around my shoulder and, and sympathize with me and say, oh, it's all right, get it out. It's, it, it's good therapy, but he didn't. R.T. said it was so hard, but once he began to forgive, this is his exact words, R.T. said, an unexpected blessing emerged as I began to forgive. A peace came into my heart that I hadn't felt in years. It was wonderful. I had forgotten what it was like. And then he went on to say this. This peace lasted for several months, but eventually I lost it. Years ago, I was in Antigua. My wife had surprised me uh, for my 50th birthday and taken us down there, and we spent a week on a catamaran. And I was scuba diving one day and I was standing on the bottom of the Caribbean. I was about 60 feet underwater, and I'm, as I'm standing there, these squid come swimming by. It, a family of squid. I say a family because two of them were big and there was a few other ones that were small. And they came by, and as they came by, they were in single file. It was amazing how symmetrical they were, how, how perfectly uniform they were. And when they got to me, they completely turned around and they were looking at me. I had all these sets of eyes looking at me and they were about, about you know, two feet away. And they were all white. 
and they're just staying there. They're just not moving. They're right there in the ocean, but they just were, were and right in line, it's, it's the same amount of space in between each one of them. And so I thought it was kind of neat. So I said, let me reach out and touch one. So I raised my hand. And just as I started to raise my hand, they, in unison, went back about two feet and turned pink. Now at that point, I'm like, oh shoot, what did I do? <laughs> and, and, and I brought my hand back and, and it was amazing because as soon as I brought my hand back, they came forward to the same spot and turned white. And this went on several times. And then they just turned and swam off. Now here's the analogy. When we allow ourselves to dwell on forgiveness, we receive peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding. We turn white and come close. But when we allow ourselves to think about what those people did to us, what they said to us, we get all churned up, we get bitter inside, and we get pink and we back up and we step away from God. The peace diminishes and unforgiveness comes back and floods our heart. It's an interesting but a very true cycle and I know you all agree. So we need to make an important decision. Which do we, which do we prefer? The peace or the bitterness? Because you can't have it both ways. As I said before, my good friend said, Dave, do you want to be right or happy? Can't have it both ways. That was actually probably the beginning of my forgiveness journey. And that was five years ago, and I still don't feel like I've gotten off of the tip of the iceberg. So peace or bitterness, you can't have it both ways. And that's a question for you and I to wrestle with today. And if you're seriously honest about forgiveness and peace, you're going to wrestle with it. If you don't, my guess is you decided to live with the guilt, to live with the bitterness. Our bitterness is really only damaging ourselves, too. When we're bitter, we delude ourselves into thinking that those who hurt us are more likely to be punished as long as we're set on revenge. We become, listen, we become afraid of letting go of those feelings. After all, if we don't make sure justice is done, then justice won't be done, and they deserve it. And listen, we make ourselves believe that it's up to us to keep the offense alive. We do that. There's a verse in Romans 12, 19. It says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. I quoted that verse last week in our discussion time downstairs. Um, and most people like me had an understanding of that verse that goes really against total forgiveness. We, we kind of looked at it as, hey, I'm just going to leave it to God. God will give them theirs. God will get them. God is saying, let the judgment be mine because I will judge accordingly because I know this person. I know their hearts. I know their motivations. I know the... The, the attitude that is going with it. You leave it with me because I'm a good, good father. We, we only hurt ourselves when we dwell on what happened to us. And, and get this, we, we, <laughs> we fantasize about what it will be and look like when they get punished. We try to cover it over, but, but at the heart, that's what we're after. We're after revenge. And, and it's based on our perceived wrong that they've done to us. And then we go further and we decide in our minds what that judgment should be. 
And when we do that, we lose our sense of peace because we have grieved the Holy Spirit. That's what we've done. Because the primary way we grieve the Holy Spirit is not by these horrible sins of action, but by these sins of our heart. And harboring bitterness in our hearts is one of the ways we grieve the Holy Spirit. Listen to Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Is it interesting, Paul, put this word first. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The quickest way to lose peace is to allow bitterness into your heart or to re-enter your heart. So this is going to require a daily commitment on our parts. We're going to need to utterly forgive them every day. We let them off the hook and we resign ourselves to this knowledge. And this is tough to take in, but it's true. Total forgiveness means we're going to resign ourselves to this knowledge. Number one, they won't get caught or found out. Number two, nobody will ever know what they did or said. Number three, they will prosper and be blessed as if they had done no wrong. Ouch. Listen, if we don't let them off the hook, if we don't forgive them, then we must resign to the understanding that the same hook, their hook too, we're with them. So either we forgive them or we don't, but it is our choice. Bitterness and revenge or peace and forgiveness. Being able to say that we're right or opting to be happy and united instead. Here's what R.T. said. He said, I actually began to do this. Forgive totally. I prayed for it to happen, for them to be blessed and prosper. I asked God to forgive them, but I have had to do this every day to keep the peace within my heart. Having been on both sides, I can tell you this. Peace is better. The bitterness isn't worth it. And he concludes his introductory, introductory chapter by stating the reasons why he wrote the book. And I, I'm going to tell you them because I concur. Because I've come to believe in this subject and the power of it well before I read the book. And some of these, most of these things that I'm going to share with you are, are the exact things that have been going on in my mind. Number one, he said, I have come to believe that the only way to move beyond hurt and go forward in life is through total forgiveness. And I don't think any subject has more, profound, has more profoundly affected me personally than this subject. And the more I interact with, with Jesus' words, the more I believe it is so central to our faith. After all, we celebrate communion every week. Why? because it reminds us of the great fact that we have been forgiven. And the second reason why I want to preach on this subject matter is because whenever I do, and again, well before I read this book, um, I, I have had people respond in, in big ways. Um, as R.T. said, he goes, they respond as if they'd never heard this message before. And again, I concur. Each time that I spoke on it, no matter how poorly I preached it, people respond. Because I think it's something that we, as Christians, as not, we struggle with it. We struggle with it on a daily basis. And we, we, we only think about the big forgiveness, but we have these small forgivenesses that we have to go through each and every day and remind ourselves, I'm going to forgive them for that. I'm not going to hold it against them. I'm not going to put it on my list. The third reason why I want to, and I chose to do a series on this, is that I've never really felt uh, or been bothered by the fact 
that I wasn't forgiven from my heart. I would hold things there, and it didn't seem to bother me. And uh, I began to wrestle with this series of messages. And in fact, I talked with John Caputo this week, and I said, I've never been, I've never felt so much that I've been in a boxing match with God because I argued with him, I fought with him, I tried to rationalize with him this week. Uh, because some people have said to me, when I've been in conflict with others, they said, Dave, just dis distance yourself from them. Uh, you know, just don't pay them any attention, Dave. Uh, you know, teach them a lesson. Dave, somebody had to speak the truth to them. And I've, I've embraced that. And now I'm realizing that's not forgiveness. That's not even close to forgiveness. The fourth reason why I want to do this series is I can't think of a better subject to talk on in such a time as ours. That Christianity article was written in 2000, The Forgiveness Factor. 2000, 20 years ago, and they were struggling with it back then. Now all you got to do is open up the paper and read about the Democrat and the Republican and the, how this... So much hate, so much conflict. Professor um, uh, Robert Enright of the International Forgiveness Institute, he commented, he said this, if you collected every logical book about person-to-person -person forgiveness, you could hold them in one hand. So it's true that... Uh, that there's not a lot of talk about the subject. And it's true that it doesn't excuse our lack of awareness about it, but it does explain it. We've been so focused on emphasizing the doctrine of truth that we've neglected the truth of forgiveness. And we so often hide it in our comments. As I said before, oh, well, somebody had to tell them the truth. Speak the truth. Speak the truth to them, Dave. But there's, a, there's an ending of that verse. Speak the truth in love. And those two things go together. And if we can't reconcile them for us, then, then if we don't have love in our heart, then Jesus is pretty clear that keep your mouth shut. Don't speak. But society shows us how much we don't listen to that verse. The fifth reason why I want to do a series on this is social scientists and psychologists, they're discovering that forgiveness leads to a victim's emotional and physical well-being. Years ago, a group of scientists, psychologists, went and evaluated Billy Graham, uh, Billy Graham crusade, and they surmised afterwards, if people could extend extend and receive forgiveness, half of our institutions would be emptied. And these aren't people that believed in God. The message is not about psychology or sociology. Our message is about the Bible. And this is biblical teaching at its core. And there is a spiritual blessing in forgiving. When we decide to take Jesus' word seriously and forgiveness from the heart and actually go about doing it because forgiveness is so difficult and can shatter us on either side. I, I want to tell you what Michelle Nelson came up with. And she came up with degrees of forgiveness. And the first one she said is detached forgiveness. And that means that there is a deduction in negative feelings toward the one that you're forgiving but no reconciliation, detached forgiveness. And she said the second is limited forgiveness. And limited forgiveness is where there's a deduction in negative feelings, but only a partial restoration has been restored. And then there's full forgiveness, or as we're, we're calling total forgiveness. And that's where there's an end to negative feelings toward the offender and a full restoration has occurred. Let's understand on our part 
we need to forgive. And I realized that with some of us, there is going to be no reconciliation with that other person. Maybe that person has passed away. Maybe they want no part of us. Maybe they don't even want to talk to us. Maybe they want to entertain a conversation with us. Maybe they hate us. But listen, our forgiveness of them is not based on them. It's based on our heart and what Jesus did at the cross. Even if there's no reconciliation, there can be total forgiveness because the kind of forgiveness happens in the heart and when it does, peace emerges with or without a complete restoration. What matters as, now listen to me on this because this is the concluding point that we need to grab hold of and take home with us. What matters is when we forgive, the Holy Spirit is able to dwell ungrieved in our heart. He is able to be utterly himself in us. And the degree to which the Holy Spirit is himself in us is the degree to which I and you are going to be able to follow through on Jesus' teachings and this issue of forgiveness. So this morning, we celebrate communion. And I hope it brings about a new quest for us to be more like Jesus. We're to forgive as he forgave. Totally. Totally. And he continues to do it every day. And you know, as well as I do, we've got a lot to be given for, forgiven for. And he said, it's done. I won't tell anyone. I'm not going to punish you. And I'm going to bless and prosper you. So as we celebrate communion, think about this issue of forgiveness. And in a second, as we conclude this morning's service, there's going to be a video. Some of you know it. It's a country song, Tim McGraw. And it's about his father, Tug McGraw, who passed away. And I want you to listen specifically to the words. Um, specifically to the words.